Praise God, we're ready to get back into this study. Jacob's trouble, that day of Jacob's trouble. As it was mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 30, we covered verses 6 through about 8, defining the fact that Jacob's day of trouble was actually just prior, just prior to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Always watch current events. Watch signs that are given from the prophets as they transpire those events that consummate the end of this age. We had begun there in Jeremiah, came forward to Mark 13, which when Christ was asked, what's it going to be like just before you return? And he gives these seven things, seven events. And they are identical with the seven seals. They are identical with the seven trumps or the last trump. Now, as we have followed through in this study, we have not come to the last trump yet. You see, each of these events, such as even God's elect being delivered up before the synagogues of Satan, this happens on a certain seal and within a certain trump. Now, as you all know from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13, that that concerns where are the dead, that being the question and subject in the Greek, that it is to happen at the last trump. What is the last trump? The seventh trump, of course. It's God's word, and he's referring to the time sequence as to the resurrection and to the close of uh, this particular dispensation. So we haven't gotten to the seventh seal nor the last trump yet, and Antichrist is already here. Many are being delivered up before him for a testimony for Jesus Christ, and nobody has flown the coop yet. Why? We don't gather back to, to Christ until the seventh trump, and these things happen first. It is known as the first tribulation. Unfortunately, most churches do not teach the two tribulations, the one that is of Antichrist. And the other, or Satan, if you choose, same party, the desolator, the spoiler, whatever name you wish to call him, he goes by many because he's a deceiver. But we see that his tribulation has deceived at this part most of the world because we had just learned in the 20th verse, for the elect's sake, God had shortened that time, or not even the elect would make it. No flesh would be saved because of the c cunning deceitful ways of instead of Jesus, that one that will come saying he is Christ when he in fact is a fake, spurious Messiah. Okay, with that thought in mind, let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's pick it back up in chapter 13, the book of Mark, verse 21, with the days just having been shortened to a five-month period in Revelation chapter 9, specifying that time, even down to the month. Verse 21, continuing, and then if any man shall say to you, now what, what is this? What is this word from Christ? If any man shall say to you, lo, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. Now this is Jesus Christ himself. You with red letter editions, it's bright red. He said, don't be deceived by that one that claims to be Christ, singular. You're going to have a plural here in a moment, which means his little ministers as well, a draw given by Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Both Satan and his little ministers shall come disguised. The English translation is transformed, but disguised as angels of light. Don't believe them. As long as you are in the flesh, as long as you can pinch yourself and it hurts, Christ, the true Christ, has not returned to this earth because of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses, say, 14 through 16, 17. At the last trump, you'll be changed into that new spiritual air body. As it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50 through about 54. There will be a change at that time. Antichrist cannot accomplish that. You'll still be in the flesh. So as long as you're in the flesh 
and somebody tells you that Christ is in Jerusalem, they're lying to you, friend. You see the whole subject back in verse 5, the number one warning, don't be deceived. Verse 22, for false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce, deceive, seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. Of course, that is not possible. Having the seal of the living God in your mind, which simply means to understand his written word, puts his truth in your mind, and there is no way that someone can lie to you or deceive you. You're too... You're too uh, well informed to be sucked in like the milk toast Christianity powder puff fluff that is taught in most churches about fly away pie in the sky. That's the way they teach it. That is not the way Christ relates the seven seals and the seven trumps as they are listed in this 13th chapter of Mark and the 24th chapter of Matthew. The question is this, friend. Do you trust your so-called church system or do you trust your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Who are you going to believe? Man in a church system or the word of the living God? 23, Christ warns, But take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things. Why would Christ say, I have foretold you all things? Well, I didn't know he had told me anything. I don't understand anything about it because you have not read his word with understanding. The simplicity in which Christ teach from this Mount of Olives, giving you the seven seals and the seven trumps and this simple message, the seven events that would happen that consummate his return in the end of this dispensation. A child can understand it. The sad part is, the church, unfortunately, most often muddles it for the layperson. Sad, but it's true. Verse 24, but in those days, what days? The days that these things transpire you just read of. After that tribulation, what was that, what did that say? After that tribulation, that first tribulation is over with. Has Christ returned? No, he hasn't. Only the Antichrist returned and tried to deceive even the very elect when they were delivered up before him. But as it is written in Luke 21, when the Spirit speaks through them in that cloven tongue that is understood in every language of this world, which is the credentials of being in, having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that every living being understands your tongue. See, man can't fake that. Then God's testimony shall go forth to the people and you will not premeditate what you will say beforehand, but it will be he that speaks through you. Even during this tribulation, of Antichrist, the true gospel shall go forth as it was written of by Joel the prophet, spoken by Peter on Pentecost Day, Acts chapter 2. After that tribulation, that's to say after the first tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. You know why? Because of the brightness of the coming of the true Christ. And you know something? There's going to be another tribulation. This tribulation is what you are saved from. The terminology to be saved means to be saved from the wrath of God, not Satan. You are saved from the wrath of Satan or his tribulation, his love making, if I can be very explicit. His religious revival that he will suck the world into, and especially the majority of Christianity as it is taught and misled this day. Am I judging them? No, it's a fact. Why can I say that then? Because they are contrary to the Word of God. Because of the brightness of his true coming. Here comes, if you would, the second tribulation. 25, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Every 
fallen angel shall be shaken out of heaven right down on earth, but they will be ridded forever in the heavens of that influx. 26. And then, and I would repeat, and then only and not until then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. My friend, I do not want to feel that I am talking down to you, but how difficult it seems to be to get the chronological order of the seals and the trumps in the minds of a people that walk in a stupa. In other words, all these events have transpired, the delivering up, the deception, the famine on the earth, the um, abomination of the desolator standing in Jerusalem on Mount uh, Zion, that's verse 14. You'll find that in um, you will find that in in the um, uh, ninth verse, or rather the ninth chapter and the twenty seventh verse of Daniel. And these signs and seals have transpired, and now we come to the last, the end, when the true Christ does return. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Verse 27. And then shall he send, and not until then, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds. Do you know what four winds we're talking about? We discussed it in the live portion not long ago. The four winds of Revelation 7 that hold back the very end of this dispensation when they were told, hold the four spirits, hold the four winds. You read of it in Ezekiel chapter 27 as well, where it said, teach the four winds and have the four winds teach the four spirits, the Ruach in the Hebrew tongue that is poured out upon the people, which is simply to say God's perfect word taught as it should be and poured on the people. Those four winds that bring about the end. What is it telling you? It is the end of this dispensation. From the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. Not until then shall God's elect be gathered back to the true Christ following the deception of Antichrist. Following the delivering up whereby the gospel may be preached using the true tongue spoken on Pentecost Day that is the cloven in the Greek meaning in every language in this world in clarity with the hearer hearing it even on his own dialect and the colloquial accent spoken in the very county that he was reared, born, raised in. Until you see that, you haven't seen the tongue the cloven tongue of Pentecost. But you shall see it. I don't feel it's that far off. Some of you have a destiny and a purpose. Some of you have eyes to see and ears to hear. And you're tired of the smoke being blowed out of holy smoke rafters. That the word of God is not taught under. Verse 28. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. He didn't say maybe you should get around to it with discipline. He said, learn it. When her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that the summer is nigh. This event transpired in the year 1948. You did not say, he did not say it would bring forth fruit, but leaves. Through horticulture of the fig tree, you plant it by setting a shoot and when you see the new growth and the new leaves, know that summer is nigh. What is summer? It's harvest. The true harvest time. Keep that thought. Verse 29. I have incidentally a work on the parable of the fig tree. And, and if you don't know it, friend, I say to you as Christ instructed, you'd better be learning it or you're in trouble. If you can't dig it out yourself, take this, stu this uh, student of God's words... Uh, efforts upon uh, the, the true meaning of the verse. 29, so ye in like manner when ye shall see these things come to pass. Did you understand? See them with your eyes. See these things come to pass. Well, what things? The first tribulation. You're going to live through it. 
It's the reign of Antichrist. It's a love fest, peaceful prosperity for everyone, a chicken in every pot. And that's why people will be deceived. They are taught in their churches from classrooms drawing the devil with horns and a pitchfork and fire coming out of his mouth. He's the most beautiful of the archangels and the most deceitful, cunning individual that God ever created outside of the throne itself. He once even walked upon the altar of fire as it was written in Ezekiel chapter 28. He's a lover and a teacher of teachers and he knows more scripture than most dumb Christians. I probably shouldn't say that, but I will anyway because most Christians are biblically illiterate. Much less do they not understand a book but they probably can't tell you which book, which the book is in, the Old or the New Testament. To their disgrace, their father has written them a letter and they have not read it with understanding. For those of you that don't, don't listen too good, that means there's a qualifier upon it. Don't read it through. Understand it as you read it. It's simple. It flows when you understand the plan of the living God. Verse 30, verily, that means truly or surely, or you can bet on it, friend. I say unto you that this generation, what generation? The generation that's living when the fig tree, the shoot, is set out in Yahushalem, shall not pass till all these things be done. It is written... And that's exactly the way it shall be. What kind of generation are we talking about? 40, 72, 120? I don't know. But I know one thing. Only a fool, as he sees with his eyes, these events transpiring even today, as the deception moves and falls into place to that great one world system spoken of in Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 to about 3 now, already in place, then you're asleep, sound asleep. Verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away. That means as it is written in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the first and second heaven and earth ages, I said both, heaven and earth ages. If it's the first earth age, it's also the first heaven age. If it's the second earth age, it's also the, the second heaven age. They will pass away. Why? Because the eternal heavenly age and the eternal earth age are coming into being as it is written in Revelation chapter 21. Listen to this now. But my words shall not pass away. This truth shall never change. This truth, his word is the living word he is the living word, and he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, for an eternity. He does not try to confuse the men's of my, uh, minds of men, but it is men themselves through their traditions that make void the word of God to participate or practice a change within it to make it better fit their mode or pleasures in the flesh life rather than listening to the clarity and the simplicity in which Christ taught on this Mount of Olives. Play by play, act by act, verse 32. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Only the Father. Not even the office of the Son knew at the time he was here. He does now. Verse 33. Take ye heed. Watch and pray. What does that mean? Watch for these signs. Watch for these events. Watch the events of the world. And pray, what does that mean? Ask the Father to make it known to you. Pray means to communicate with your Father. It means talk to Him. For you know not when the time is. You know not when it comes to pass. Our Father has given us every detail. Did Jesus not say, but take ye heed, behold, I have foretold you all things? Through what? The prophets. That's why you must study them and become acquainted with them 
It's better than reading tomorrow's newspaper. You know why? Tomorrow's newspaper is not yet available. This is. 34. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey. Do you know what that means? The Son of Man is just like a man that has left for a, a, and he's a long way off. You can feel pretty secure. He's not coming back right now. So your mind gets a little playful maybe. You understand? Who left his house and gave authority to his servants. That's to say the house of God was left in the hands of the servants and commanded the porter to watch the man he put in charge. That's the chief shepherd and the shepherd of each house of God. To watch. To watch what? To watch this word in the current events. The signs. Verse 35. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh. At even. Or at midnight. Or at the cock crowing. Or in the morning. Do you understand that all four main points of the day are, are, are stated there? In other words... There, you don't know what time of the day, and he specifically draws out each quarter. I might say one thing. In, um, in the, um, when the phrase, hour, month, day, and year are used, no man knows the hour, month, day, or year. That means the instant. When they're all pulled together under one article, it means no man knows the instant. The wise as they begin to see these signs come to pass, at least know the generation. So, how do you watch? You take an interest in your Father's Word. And you grow skilled and you grow bold in it. It's a thrill and a delight to see the signs of God as they come to pass. It's glorious to hear and to understand. Verse 36. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. If you're the porter, you're supposed to be watching the gate. You're, the sheep are all asleep and you're supposed to be wide awake. Many of you have a destiny and a purpose and you've known it since you were a child. Stay awake. How do you stay awake? By being aware of what your duties are, what your watch is, what the orders of your post are who you owe to are to challenge and who you're not to challenge, who has access and who does not, who has a right to pass and who does not. The Kenites, if you don't know the enemy, how are you going to keep one of them away from the sheep? That's like letting a wolf into a literal sheep pen. When you let a Kenite into your church that's not converted, if he's there for evil, you're not very smart if you allow it. Well, I, we, we have an open meeting. Oh, you do. Are you the porter? You better be watchful, friend. Verse 37. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Not just the porter. All. Watch. The simplicity of the seven seals and the seven trumps could not be made any simpler than they are in this 13th chapter of Mark detail by detail of what shall transpire, what shall come to pass that brings our gathering back to the true Christ. You know, there is not one verse within that that mentions fly away. In most of the places, unfortunately, I'll stop picking on them for a moment. Most places where it states you escape that hour of temptation, it is not by flying away, my friend. You escape the hour of temptation by not finding yourself tempted. Jesus Christ himself set the example for you in the wilderness for a 40-day period. Do you understand what 40 means in biblical numerics? It means probation. Your own probation. Jesus Christ set the example that he could go through the full probation 40 days without eating one bite of food in that weakened state and still conquer Satan by telling him, get behind thee. So when Satan comes as Antichrist to tempt you, Christ did not find him tempting. 
was Satan begging him to take all the wealth of the world just simply to worship him. Christ refused. What are you going to do? When some of your own relatives have you delivered up, as it's written back in the um, 12th verse of this chapter, 13 Mark, because they think he is Jesus, and they say, Jesus, help this poor lost soul. He's really a good old boy and means well, but he just thinks you're Antichrist instead of Jesus. Delivers you up. Are you going to be tempted then? You see, it's like Christ walk in the wilderness. His tempting in the wilderness. It's like the woman that, that flees to the wilderness in Revelation 12 after Satan is on this earth. You're protected in that wilderness. Christ was tempted in the wilderness, so will you be. Please take the picture of some desolated, wild, rugged place out of your mind. Any time Satan is present, it is a wilderness. I might even add a little spiritual connotation and draw an analogy from the Hebrew word wilderness, Arabian, which is to say neither night nor day. It's like the end of the day where you've got a little night and a little day all mixed together, meaning a confusing time. It even means in the Hebrew tongue like you would take hair and braid it. It's mixed. It even goes of a mixed people. Are you going to be mixed up when you're delivered up? No, I don't think you will be. Remember, two tribulations. The tribulation of Christ comes to pass when he sets foot on the earth and not one stone is left standing. And presto, instantly, we're changed from flesh into an eternal spiritual body. I'm talking about God's elect. Some will not have a mortal, uh, an eternal soul, only a mortal, meaning liable to die. There are two tribulations. The two tribulations are the day of Jacob's trouble, which begins with that first tribulation. I hope you've enjoyed this study. May it keep you on guard. And as our Savior has said, my friend, if you have eyes to see, and if you have ears to hear, then I say to you, listen and watch. Okay, we'll be taking a, a break away from this subject. I want to continue on. I want to talk to you just a little longer. I want us to maybe zoom in just a little bit. I'll tell you what, I'll put this on a different camera here. I, we didn't try this before. I want you to see a little article that appeared in the Arkansas Gazette. You hear me talk about churches and what's taught there a great deal. I want you to see, this came out. A good pastor knows when to obfuscate. Do you know what obfuscate means? Get a good look at his picture. I may not give you his name, you know. Uh, a man that would teach other ministers how to make a, a congregation and put them in a stupor is not fit to be called minister. His, his, I wouldn't tell you his name, but his initials are Gary Nolan. And the article's from El Dorado, Arkansas. A good pastor knows when to make the congregation in a stupor to deceive them. That is a disgrace. But that's what they're taught in seminary. Listen to it. El Dorado. Excerpt from the Practical Guide to the Christian Ministry. How fortunate we are that we have shepherds like this. The divisions between conservative and liberal Christians make a minister's life difficult. And you know what? That point's true. You know why? Because of the dumb deacons. Because if a minister doesn't do just right, the deacons can't even. Christians in churches that make Phil Donahue appear closed-minded have one and only one minority group that they dislike. He shows his stupidity in that statement because the group he's calling the minority is the majority. And I can tell you this man is not a successful pastor and I've never heard of him before. If he is so cockeyed off base that he doesn't even know what the majority is in the South, He's lost. He must have come from up north somewhere in, in, a, in a place where uh, they don't let him see daylight too often. Nice fella, huh? Uh, congratulations to El Dorado. Their denomination's conservative minority. 
That's what he calls them. Son, conservatives are not the minority in the South. Have you, you better wake up. Christians in churches with names like First Church of Beady-Eyed Fanatics. Well, now you really give the conservative a break there, don't you, son? You're, you're about like a lot of other pastors and preachers and people that call themselves men of God. You know, he really gives you a fair shake there. You understand? He has tried through psychology to fold the mind of some dumb green seminary student. Are likewise intolerant of their members who have liberal tendencies as an experienced pastor, the author has some suggestions that may be helpful for surviving the end fighting. I want you to listen to the suggestions of this good shepherd pastor. Remember through remember though that the term conservative and liberal oversimplified by lumping together many people who also despise each other. He's got a nice outlook, doesn't he? Have you ever noticed that? Especially in the South, I've never noticed that. What kind of mind do you have, friend? The complexity of the American religious scene today means there is no substitute for learning the exact makeup of your own congregation. As the shepherd of the flock, you must know your sheep well enough to feel confident that you are catering to the majority's exact wants. You know, I'm a pastor, and I cater to my father's wants. I could care less what the sheep want. So we see, friend, who you please. You please man. You're a man pleaser, a soothsayer, rather than pleasing God. I'm going to take a little more time, you know. And as much as we read how these churches will do in the end times, I want you to hear from the good pastor. And, and I'm not picking on him only. It's the majority that feel this way. Let's just, in as much as they feel like coming out and making, putting a public article in one of the, the state's major newspapers. Let's enjoy it, all right? He continues, whenever it is possible, you should avoid conservative liberal sorts of issues. A smart pastor will know when his interpretation of a passage of Scripture would risk getting him labeled a member of his denomination's despised minority. This is one of the very few times in a pastor's career when something that he learned in seminary actually proves useful. Well, at least he knows what quality seminaries we have. After he has graduated, remember how quickly old Professor Zumwalt could put seminary students to sleep? After quickly consulting your old class notes, you can do the same thing to the members of your adult Sunday school class. Isn't that an asinine thing for a pastor to say? I mean, I'm just shucking it down, friend. To say that rather than interpreting a scripture of God's word with discipline as it's written, interpret it to suit the crowd. I resent that. And when men such as this call themselves men of God, God help the church in America. Sticky theological questions can be handled with a simple strategy. A clergy person who is asked, how literally do you take the second coming? I think it's glorious. Don't you take it pretty good, friend, you that have studied with me? He's going to tell you how to get around the question. We just read of it direct from God's Word, and I think it's precious. But this clown that calls himself shepherd, shepherd of stupefied, obfuscate sheep that he himself has done the obfuscating, they're so stupid, if they would listen to someone like this, rather than studying God's word, they're in trouble. How literally do you take the second coming? Can escape by using his old church history notes to this question. The wise pastor will reply. That's his word, the wise pastor. I'll tell you this. The gutless 90-day wonder that would call himself a man of God would answer the way this clown states. Not a pastor of God. Well, in 564 A.D., Theodore um, of uh, Nespistia and Oda of Turin had a debate on the ver this very subject at the Faith Council of Odessa. Trail off. These words are magic. 
As the pastor says them, his questioner's eyes glaze over. After that, the pastor can say anything. He can recite nursery rhymes. And as long as he remembers to look solemn and clerical, and I will add constipated, <laughs> and as long as he speaks in a monotone, his questioners will mumble, thanks, that's very interesting, and wander away. That's your pastor of today. Eldorado, be proud of him. Keep him down there, though, won't you? That's the way the church is today. Do I blame this pastor totally? No. He has his defensive mechanism up. Because if any man or woman of God in most of the denominational churches make one stand today with any strength or any truth of God's Word interpreted in free will with the knowledge and the gift calling of Almighty God, he is fired. The old boy's right about that. All he's doing is telling them how to protect their jobs not do their job. To do your job, you're supposed to interpret God's word exactly as it is written, and he has given you the gift of interpreting to teach that to the sheep, and they will all grow and all be strong. And you will have a strong group of Christians, such as we have in this church and this family. I make no apologies for their deacon boards or for this cowardly position that it has placed the pastor, that they are afraid to even say, straighten your act up. To be fired. To be some stuffy old deacon that doesn't even have the calling of God, would say, there ain't nobody going to talk to me that way. Fire him. And he would be gone. What a sad situation. I thank God for this church and this family. And for those of you, that like God's word straight whether it stings, burns, or cracks and put the shoe on and wear it to the glory of the living God. Well, bless your hearts. I hope you've enjoyed the two tribulations. And let's all pray for this poor old boy. You know, here we got a pastor and he's uh, this dark cloud coming out over the congregation. I just wonder if any of you have ever sit under a pastor like that. Aren't they boring? Come out into the light and the truth of God's Word. All right. Bless your hearts. You listen a moment, please.